After spending over 100 hours in Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord, I'm still discovering new and exciting things that keep me plugged into the game, much like someone addicted to a hardcore drug. Only this drug's name is called Radia. If you already saw my first 9 tips video, you know that a lot of what was covered will help you get a running start in the game. But with a slew of patches that have been released and a number of balances, I have 9 more tips to help you get started or further your adventures in the mighty realm of Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord. Quick disclaimer, as always, with any kind of early access content, some of these tips might fall out of use with further patches, but hopefully the ones that I've selected are relatively timeless or from systems that are a bit more set in place. So I'm going to go through a lot of those tips here today and talk about how I can hopefully make your playthroughs a little bit easier or a little bit faster and more efficient. Now I have talked about some of these tips in one or two of my videos before, not all of them, but I do want to drill down into a little bit more detail in this video to help you kind of really get started with your game. So let's get cracking on our list. Our first tip is about attributes and it's going to start out in the character creation screen. This will be helpful for your first or your next playthrough depending on what patch is being released and what modifications are made. But when making your character, try not to focus so much on skill points. It's easy to get caught up in the focus point system, the little hashes, of completing the narrative of your character through the character creation screen. But one thing you have to take into account is that your options are dependent upon A, the culture you selected at the start, and B, the occupation of your parents, as this will change the options presented to you after the second menu. For instance, a Sturgeon character can start with five roguery, whereas no other culture can do the same. So my recommendation to you is, once you've selected the cultural bonus you want, which may or may not be bugged right now, uh, just make sure the attributes you've selected for your character match up with what you want to focus on. For instance, I want this character to focus on two-handed, riding, and throwing. So I've got four vi vigor, I've got four control, and three endurance. It's important that I get a higher attribute score in the corresponding skill than the actual skill focus. The little hash mark there that I was talking about earlier. Because the attribute gives a larger bonus to your learning rate than the skill focus. Also, you get far more skill focuses in the game at one per level with only one attribute per three levels. This should hopefully help break down the analysis paralysis that can be caused by getting the configuration of options just right when creating a character versus just simply focusing on the attributes. Tip number two is optimizing your companions. You don't always need the best companion as they will level up while they're with you. And with attributes being somewhat randomized with a baseline of averages, you might get a higher skilled companion that has a lower attribute in their preferred skill. You're better off getting the most convenient companion for the specific skill you want and making sure that their additional combat skills support the role you have in mind for them in your army. A really good example here would be Sorius the Healer. She has got 84 medicine. Uh, this is, she started at 60 and she's boosted up to an extra 24 points in being my companion. But of course the best surgeon has 120 skill, but maybe not the best intelligence. So, a really good example then of that would be Quaris the, of the Wastes. He is the best scouting companion, but his cunning is really only four, with his social being five and he's got zero social skills. So running around the map to gobble up all these best companions isn't always the best choice because you will oftentimes fall behind the power curve as the rest of the world gets stronger and better and you have to deal with nations that fall as you kind of spend time picking up your companions. But I would still always recommend getting a scouting and a healing companion as fast as you can. Tip number three is on mounting sieges. Now in order to maximize your chances of success and reduce casualties during a siege, you should take advantage of at least three siege engines. As of the creation of this video, there is a problem with how the AI sieges and will oftentimes get stuck on siege tower ladders, uh, group up at the top of stairs on the wall and not charge into the keep, or just march up ladders and get butchered. This doesn't happen all the time, but enough that it's dangerous. What you should do is build siege engines that will destroy the walls, the enemy siege equipment, and allow your troops to just funnel into the openings without getting stuck in buggy situations where a 5 to 1 advantage is neutralized by self-imposed choke points due to bad AI. So, when you get your, uh, your siege engines queued up, you do that by left-clicking one of these blinking uh, locations and then choosing one like a trebuchet like this. Um, you want to make sure it gets near built. So you can see this guy's just about to complete. 
wait for it to complete, and I'll show you what we'll do. We'll stop, we'll pause it, we'll left click it, then move it to reserve. This will prevent the other siege engines from destroying it. And you're gonna do this until all four are built up. And then you're gonna click this location again uh, on, on all four of them. You're gonna to pause to do this. And you see this little icon that says trebuchet, but now it says one. Well, once you've completed all four, this will say four. Just boom, you've put all four back and they will all attack at the same time, destroying the walls, destroying the ballista. And this is probably the best way to deal with sieges. Uh, do keep in mind, if you do use this advice, Please make sure that there are no other armies coming to just rout you. Be mindful of stuff around the map, and also make sure you have enough food. That should help you out when you are besieging a settlement, either as your own kingdom or the vassal of another. Tip number four is minor clans. Now, I did cover this in my How to Make a Kingdom guide linked in the upper right corner, but in the beginning portions of the game and throughout your playthrough, really, you should really be trying to hunt down minor clans in between wars or big engagements. There's a number of reasons behind this. For one, in the early game, if you focus on some of the weaker minor clans or the more minor lords within the clan, you can rake up a lot of good money and renown by looting them and then ransoming them to the tavern. But you also have a chance of getting high tier loot from the commanding general who will invariably charge your army and get killed. Lastly, depending on your faction, you can use the prisoners to convert into soldiers that fill the gaps of your army, especially in the early game. Take, for example, the Brotherhood of the Woods in Valandia. Well, let me bring up how to find these guys. You're going to press N to bring up your encyclopedia, press Clans, then press Minor. This is going to show you all of the minor clans. Now, the Brotherhood of the Woods has access to the Arboreal line. If I type in Arboreal up here, I will see the Brotherhood of the Woods. Now, these guys are very cheap and easy to acquire early archers, and you won't have to kind of go through your Valandian recruit line to get your crossbowmen so early. You can just use these guys. And a really good further example is one that I actually even have in my own party are the Elethero. Now these guys stand, uh, I believe Elethero translates to free people. These guys have a really cool kind of Sturgeon aesthetic and they eventually evolve into like a heavy Visigoth cataphract. So if you're making maybe a predominantly Sturgeon campaign wherein you don't have access to a ton of really good high quality cav, killing the Elethero will give you a high, high quality cav unit that also fits the aesthetic of a Sturgeon army. So I'd really encourage you to discover these minor clans across the battlefield and attack them just like this, the Legion of the Betrayed, which gives me the Hastati Triarii line of really cool Legionnaires. Number five is marriage. Now this is something that I only recently got involved with in the game and I'm surprised at how much it will benefit you, the player, if you do this earlier rather than later. What you want to do is pop open your encyclopedia, go to Heroes, sort it by either male or female depending on the character you're making. I'm, a I'm looking for females. And then sort the occupation by a noble. And then I'm going to do Empire because that's the culture that I'm primarily playing with. You can set sort this to whatever you wish. Then click Sora because she's the one that I went ahead and married. And from this, the biggest benefit is that you'll get an additional companion that helps you produce children, which will then become companions for you once they're of age. Also, you will get access to their armor, which is more often than not very nice tier 6 armor. Fair warning, I wouldn't rely on this tip as a good way to get money, as with the modifier system being added in 1.2, this could mean that we could get a modifier added to the items that would thus drastically reduce their price. So just rely on this for the actual stats, which wouldn't be affected by the mod modifier. And then the other big thing you get from this is if you click over to your clan, the um, your wife and your kids do not fall under your companions, so they will not be restricted by your clan tier rank, and you can have more companions that are either um, this one's focused more on steward and on trade or a more combat oriented uh, wife and or husband. Tip number six is perk tags. Now, as of the creation of this video, there are still a number of perks in the game that are bugged and not working properly. But this next tip is a timeless one and really important when determining how to build out the perks for not just your main character, but every character in your clan. When you take a look at your character menu and you hover over every perk in the skills scroll, you should see a parenthetical notation that tells you how or when the skill will apply. Take for example the steward line. A number of these skills are only active if you are the governor, the clan leader, or maybe even the quartermaster. So when you're looking at these notations, make sure that you're selecting perks that you or yourself 
uh, are going to benefit from, the roles that you have in mind for the individual members of your clan as well. So if it says party member, then your companion simply needs to be a member of the party versus say again, a party leader, which will only apply to yourself or a companion you've had create their own army. Now, another quick little tip here is to look at this little portion. This will tell you how to increase a skill. Also pressing this I button will tell you whether or not the skill will apply to you or a specific role. So a quartermaster for the steward. The roguery will give us party leader and also a number of the roguery perks are not uh, working right now. But that'll bring us pretty nicely into our next tip. Which brings us nicely to number seven, leveling roguery. A roguery might not seem like an overly important skill, and with its current iteration in the game, there are not many overall benefits to it outside of the passive that it grants you as the party leader. That passive can actually be pretty substantial. Here's one of my companions with a very high 120 roguery skill. You can see that this grants 30% better loot from enemies to, again, the party leader. And as of the creation of this video, a lot of the skills, like I was saying, aren't working, the, the perks themselves. And since there's no clan role, like a spy master, you, yourself, the clan leader, can't directly benefit from roguery. But I still think roguery has a place. I have a character with only 32 skill, and he was still able to get a tier 6 chain chest from a C raider boss after doing two hideouts. So I think right now it's not in a great place, but it will be way better in the future, especially if we get, say, again, clan roles that you can leverage roguery. But how do we level this skill? Let's jump over to another save. Let's talk about a quick little trick to getting your roguery leveled quickly, especially in the early stages of the game. Now you wanna find a band of looters with prisoners. You hold down Alt, you can see the prisoners. Now grab a lot of peasants. Peasants, you then want to group into their own group in the party screen. You do this by selecting the group, selecting the formation, make them to say four, for example. Then you want those peasants to do all the damage fighting other looters so that they level up. They will level up from peasants to watchmen. And from watchmen, you have two chains. You want to go down the mercenary guard chain because those crossbows do blunt damage, which almost guaranteed is going to give you around an 80% prisoner ratio when you're attacking those looters. So you get yourself a nice group of hired guard. I've got a mercenary guard of 15 right here. You set your main infantry in front with a shield wall, and then you use your mercenary guard to just pluck apart the looters. The result will be a nice band of 33 or so, depending on your, uh, your allotment based off of your army size, set of looters. Now, if I take a look at my current skill level, I have 502 experience. Now, from my testing, you get around 40 or so experience when you're at this, this really small portion of the, of the game. Now, keep in mind, I have four cunning, I have five focus points, so your mileage might vary with the actual experience you get by donating. But going here to a tavern, then ransoming your prisoners, boom, just got two skill points in roguery and it's now 35. But keep in mind here, it's not the quality of the prisoners, it's the quantity. So 30 Imperial Cataphracts will give you the same amount of experience as 30 looters. That's going to be your biggest way to increase roguery quickly. Number eight is leveling leadership. And leadership is one of the strongest skill lines in the game, but it's one that takes a long time to really get any skill points in. Even when you're at the point that you can do it, it might not seem as easy to accomplish just because of the tax of pumping influence into your army to maintain its cohesion or even summoning other lords to your aid. There's a bit of a trick to this though. To accomplish what I'm about to say, you either need to have your own kingdom or be a vassal to another, or else you cannot create an army. Vassalizing as soon as you reach tier two will help you get a jump on your leadership skill gains. What you can do is have one of your companions break off into their own party, then immediately form an army and summon them to your aid. So you do this by going to the clan menu, going to parties, we can create new party, selecting someone, and then you've got a new party created. But keep in mind that you need to create a party with your companion that is above 40% strength. So take for example this gentleman. His max party size is 65, so need to give him 26 or so troops to be at enough strength to form an army. And don't worry, it's not like you're going to run off and lose his troops. He'll be with you the entire time. Let's just give him some quick troops here. For a good measure. And done. You're all set. You've got a second army right here. So what you then do is press this button down on the lower right. This will summon an army, sort it by distance, and you'll see that your gentleman is close to you. And you'll see that this costs zero influence. And you just press done, 
and you've formed an army. Press fast forward. There you go. He's set in your army. So you can now go do all the things you would normally do as a single party, but you're now doing it as an army and you're gaining leadership skill. And the most important portion of the leadership line, in my opinion, is this one right here, the disciplinarian perk. You are able to revert bandits into regular troops. What does this mean? Well, every single bandit line is based off of some culture. So take, for example, Hillmen of Mountain Bandits. Mountain Bandits can then become really strong Volandians or even really strong Volandian um, infantry or their calf. But they can also progress into their quote-unquote noble line or the Volandian Squire line. You can see this down to the Volandian Champion all the way into the Banner Knight. Even if you look at Forest Bandits, which is another really, really good one here, these guys will jump down into Batanian Fians and Fian Champions. So I think that the disciplinarian perk is extremely beneficial. You cannot progress these guys into their standard regular troop format until you have that disciplinarian perk. And this will help to get you a lot of gains very quickly. All right, number nine, our final tip is batch upgrading your units in your army. A number of people have seen me doing this on my live streams, and it is a sentiment that is talked about quite a bit on the Mountain Blade subreddit. But you should always be quote unquote batch upgrading your units. Now, what I mean by that is take a look at my group of uh, Sturgeon soldiers here. Uh, 11 of the 17 are ready to be upgraded to the next tier. But the way that experience works is that it's shared across the stack, as it were. So if one Sturgeon, Sturgeon soldier were to kill an enemy, then the experience is split across the rest of the stack of 17. If I were to upgrade all 11 right now, then I'd be effectively cutting down the amount of experience the remaining six could attain, since there will now be 11 new units competing for experience against them. Lastly, if you upgrade your units one at a time, especially during the beginning portions of the game, you might end up having a soldier with better athletics or riding, outpacing the rest of the army and getting killed off, wasting the experience and the time you invested. Just make sure you keep an eye on this, as any experience gained after all 17 of these men are ready for an upgrade will not carry over into the next tier. So hopefully this quick list of tips will give you a better idea of how to really get the most of your current or your next playthrough. I know that I find myself re-rolling a new character with every major beta or live branch patch that has a drastic sweeping set of changes. I will reiterate one last time that since we are in early access, there is a chance some of this might change, but I hope that your journey through Colradia is even more enjoyable now. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, go ahead and leave a comment below about some of the things that you're really enjoying or some really hot tips that really have boosted your playthrough. I really want to make sure that we continue to grow this vast font of knowledge for Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord, especially as a lot of the patches have um, some subtle, hidden little uh, uh, patch notes that are not actually typed out or revealed. It's something that's discovered by the community as a whole. So as we progress through early access, please guys continue to share your information. But again, as always, have a good one and take care.